I'm so glad to be here today at Google because you guys are my people. And what do I mean by that? So when I play two truths and a lie, I say things like, I once punched a guy in the nose and broke his, I once punched a guy in the face and I broke his nose. I can't feel the third toe on my left foot and never have been. And I went to computer sleepaway camp when I was 14 years old. I can feel all my toes. I went to computer sleepaway camp when I was 14 years old, and I'm old. So that means that I went to computer sleepaway camp back when we programmed Macintosh computers, like before they were called Apple. I learned how to program COBOL, I learned how to program BASIC, and a little bit of Fortran because I was super cool. I also didn't have my first kiss till I went to college. Super cool. But you guys are my people because we are awesome nerds. And I love being a nerd, because being a nerd makes me feel like me. But I want to start by telling you about a time when I didn't feel so much like me. I didn't feel empowered. I didn't feel awesome. I didn't feel smart. In fact, I felt like a complete and utter failure. And it was the first day of school. Last year on the first day of school, my kids were such disasters. They were so terrible. They were such unmitigated demons that they didn't stop bickering long enough for me to get that all-important proof point that I am the world's best mother. The photo. The first day of school photo with your kids in the perfectly matching outfits and all the hair exactly in place and their teeth brushed so I could post it on social media. Now, my kids are normally pretty amazing, pretty lovely, pretty sweet people. But on this day, I don't know what was going on. I don't know what they had for breakfast, but they were terrible. And so I did what any self-respecting parent would do. I went over and I closed the windows. You know where I'm going with this, right? I don't want the neighbors to hear me. And then I yelled at my kids with every fiber in my being, like, ah! like alien came out of my body. And then we drove to school in stony silence. Me sitting in the front seat, really second-guessing every decision I'd ever made as a parent, and second-guessing every sacrifice I ever chose not to make as a working parent. Now, they were in the back seat till we got to school, and as soon as we got to school, they walked out and they slammed the door and they left a, a trail of teenage angst so bad that no amount of Febreze could get rid of it. And then I drove home fantasizing about all the ways I'd get them back. I'd put them in that shirt, you know, the like, one with the two head holes, or get a long shirt, let them work it out, right? Or maybe I drop them off like 20 miles away from home without that third appendage that they've come to know as, as the cell phone. But I found myself feeling like a failure because somewhere along the way, I had thought that this is what life would look like. Success, clear shot, easy, follow the path that I was given take that scorecard and check all the boxes along the way. And it turns out that success doesn't actually look like that straight shot. And it turns out that that scorecard that you have that's been in your pocket since before you even remember when you got it is making you feel that same way. Does anybody have a scorecard in their back pocket that you've been following along, checking all the boxes to make sure that you feel successful? Do you know how you got yours? Let me tell you how I got mine. First, there was the fourth grade teacher. And I had a fourth grade teacher who said, you know, Laura, you're a pretty argumentative young woman. You should be a lawyer. So I told her she was wrong. <laughs> I mean, obviously, right? But then I proceeded to create an educational path that put me on the, law, the, the, on the, on the path to law school, where I found myself on the first day going, oh my god, I don't belong here. This is not right for me. So I dropped out and I joined a presidential campaign. And on that presidential campaign, I met and I began to date the man of my mother's dreams. So I didn't fit into that definition of success that my teacher gave me. My teacher who had no crystal ball and no exact idea of where I was going, but had some random thing that she said on a random Tuesday and I took as definitional. And then I met Alan. Now, Alan came in the form of a six foot two, Nice Jewish boy. He was a medical student from a good family. It was like the holy grail. But here is the problem with Alan. Every time I would kiss him, all I could think was milk, 
butter, cheese, eggs. I need to pick up the dry cleaning. I should probably start working on that project. I just had no spark with Alan. And I would tell my grandmother my tale of me and no spark Alan as he became known in our family. My grandmother, who would watch her own definition of success disappearing, would say, you just need to concentrate. But try as I might, that didn't work either. So fast forward about 10 years, and I found myself as the youngest vice president of an executive search firm that did specifically nonprofit work. And I had figured it out. I was saving the world. We were curing cancer. We were helping babies. We were inoculating against all sorts of disease. And I would sit there in my office feeling like I finally made it. It was success. I had gotten there. And I would look across the table at my, at my clients, and they would look at me, and it turns out they didn't see me on the same side of the table. They saw me on my side. They were on their side doing the thing that I considered to be success, and they saw me on my side of the table with my boss's definition of success. Do the work as fast and as efficiently and as profitable as possible. Between us sat our P&L. So maybe you had that teacher or that parent or that boss. Or maybe when you were 15, 16, 17 years old, somebody said, pick a path, pick a major, pick a trade, pick a college, and you said, OK. But you know what you don't have when you're 15, 16, 17, 18 years old? Frontal lobe. <laughs> you know, the part of your brain that actually helps you make good decisions. So here we are, we're 15, 16, 17, 18 years old. We're making decisions that are going to affect the rest of our lives when we literally do not have the capacity to make good ones. So now how many of you think you have that scorecard in your pocket and you're going, hmm, I'm on a path. Is this a path I want to be on? I'm not so sure. We all, wherever we are, wherever we're working, can find places in those jobs, in those careers, in those companies to find our fullest sense of ourselves. And I wrote this book because after 20 years of interviewing leaders, what I realized is that the ones that I was talking to, I was a recruiter. I was talking to people who were super successful, right? That's why I wanted to talk to them. They were talking to me because they weren't necessarily happy, which is why they wanted to get in my office. I was interested in the idea that success didn't always equal happiness. And what I realized is that the people who had both success and happiness understood who they were. So how do we figure out when we're looking at our life and we're looking at our resume and we're looking at our profile and we're saying, I built this life that looks great on paper. But is it a life that I actually want? Is it a life that works for me? How do I take this career? How do I take this job? How do I take this company and make it actually work for the life that I want to build? And the answer is that we go to social media. Because there's so many Kardashians there, right? Like one of them has to know the answer. There's Kim. And Kylie and Kendall and Chris, and my god, she even married Kanye, right? She married a guy with a K in his name, and if Yeezy doesn't know what's right for us, I have no idea what we're going to do. And what do we get when we get to social media? We see these tropes, these messengers of what I call the four horsemen of the success apocalypse, and they come trotting in innocently enough, and they say things like, you, they say things like, you just have to lean in. And if you dream it, you can do it. Hustle, baby. Got to wake up, rise, and grind. And how's that working out? It's not making us any happier. It's not making us feel any more fulfilled. But we follow them anyway. And the first one is, the first one is purpose. There is this idea that says that if you do not do jobs that are of service, then your jobs have no purpose at all. And there is this idea that if you do not have sacrifice, then it's not really service. Now, I spent 20 years placing people in nonprofits, and I am an unimpeachable expert who can tell you that there are lots of other ways to have purpose in your work. And in fact, not only that, nobody gets to decide what purpose is but you. The second is balance. And balance is this idea that you have work here, and you have life here, and never the twain shall meet. Now, that was created by somebody before we had technology. Right? Where we have, we are who we are all the time in all places. So of course your life is going to be totally overlapped. And I don't want us to look for work-life balance. I want us to look for work-life alignment. 
And then next, we have happiness. I think the four worst words in the English language are, I'll be happy when. I'll be happy when I get that raise. I'll be happy when I get that promotion. I'll be happy when I get married. I'll be happy when I get divorced. I'll be happy when. Does anybody in this room want to be happy now? Absolutely. And then there's my favorite, and we've all seen her. She's the flaxen-haired beauty wearing boho chic. She's always looking out, gazing longingly over a sunset or Coachella. <laughs> and she implores us, she implores us with all her might to follow your passion. So I think follow your passion is the world's worst advice. In fact, I think it's the spoken word, career advice, illegitimate sister of the live, laugh, laugh, love tattoo. And apologies to anybody in this room who has one of those tattoos. But live, love, laugh, it's ridiculous. Follow your passion. It's not a destination. It's not even a road map. What that tells you is the very first time it gets hard, that you can't do what you're going to do, that you hit a roadblock. Suddenly, oh, it must not be meant for you. That's crazy. Rather than follow your passion, think about the times where you have worked hard to get the things that you want. You haven't followed your passion. You've invested in your passion. And you know as well as I do that you cannot be insatiably hungry for someone else's goals. And that means you have to figure out what you really want and what matters to you. So that means we need to all collectively say, screw the Joneses. So who are these Joneses? You know them. These are your friends on social media, the ones with their perfect photos and the perfect beach vacations, and there's kids that are dressed with the matching outfits on the first day of school, right? You know, them. Ugh, they're the worst, right? They are the worst. But when we spend our time trying to figure out and trying to fit in to everyone else's definition, we can't help but feel like failures. So when I picked up my kids that day from school, I had all these plans in my mind, right, of how I was going to get them back, like, sweet revenge is going to be mine. Yes. And then we drove home. And over dinner that night, I started telling them all the ways that they were horrible humans. And the day had gone past. They'd sort of gotten their way through it. And my older son said, you know, Mom, it was the first day of school. We were a little nervous. New classes, new friends, new teachers. And my younger son said, you know, Mom, you had a chapter due that day, and it wasn't going that well. So maybe you weren't at your best either. And we decided, rather than having a punishment, we'd have a do-over. So we woke up the next morning. I made breakfast, they showered, everybody wins, and I got that photo. And not only did I get that photo, our puppy sat for the photo as well. I think she thought she was going to school. But here's what I did with that photo. What do you think I did with that photo? I posted it to social media, of course, <laughs> hello. But I posted that photo with the caption, happy second day of school. And I talked about how our definition of success was, in fact, not actually having the perfect first day photo. But it was having the kind of family where we could talk about who we were when we were at our best and what we did for each other to support ourselves in the community that lives under our house when we were at our very worst. Because what I learned is that when we judge ourselves, when we judge our bloopers by everyone else's highlight reels, we can't help but feel like failures. And that goes for that scorecard you have in your back pocket that was given to you by that teacher or that parent or that boss or your 15, 16, 17-year-old self that's still talking in your ears today. So in 2013, I read Lean In. And I wanted to love it. I know I was supposed to love it, right? I was part of the army of women who read it and loved it. And here's the thing. It worked for me. I did everything right. I took every opportunity as early as I possibly could. I said yes to every project, and I did it the minute I was asked so that it would pay dividends for my career for the rest of my life. And I made it. I made it to that spot where I was sitting at that table looking across, looking across the table at my clients. I had gotten to the top. And I looked around one day, and I said, the top of what? 
I wanted to live a life that mattered. I wanted to live a life of consequence. And I knew I wasn't going to cure cancer, and I knew I wasn't going to have a full-page obit written about me in the New York Times when I died, but I wanted to live a life that mattered to me, to the people that I loved and the causes I held dear. I wasn't upset about Lean In with the amount of privilege that Sheryl Sandberg used to get to where she was going. We would all be folly not to do that. I was more upset because this one unflinching, myopic definition of success that the fastest and most expedient path to the corner office was the only one that mattered didn't fit me anymore. So I thought about the people that I'd interviewed, the thousands of leaders that I'd interviewed while I was running this search firm. And these were leaders that came from the for-profit sector, the non-profit sector, the, uh, the, the government sector. And I thought, who were the ones who lived a life of consequence and were also happy? They were successful and they were happy. And what I realized is what the ones that were happy had were they had consonants. So what is consonance? You know those moments when the very best of what you do is being called upon to solve a problem at hand, something you actually care about, and you're being rewarded for in a way that is karmically or financially interesting to you? You're in alignment. You're in flow. You are the very best version of yourself. That's consonance. In short, it is when what you do matches who you are. And in order for us to live these lives of consonants, we have to take that scorecard and get rid of it. So I asked for some interaction. I haven't gotten it yet, so I'm going to force a little bit on you. I want you to look at the person on your right. I want you to look at the person on your left. I want you to raise your right hand. And I want you to repeat after me. From this day forth, I will no longer Take advice from girls in flower crowns. <laughs> and here's what I want you to think about. When you took this job, you thought about what the value of the job was. And I did that. I spent a lot of time when I was recruiting thinking about the value of the job for the people that I was interviewing. I would say there were about eight motivating factors. They were things like, what's the mission of the organization? What's the value of the brand on my resume? Am I going to be inspired by the leadership? How much will I learn? What's the scale of impact that I might make? There are certain things like geography or benefits. And of course, there's money. And I was really good at my job. I was the vice president of Smile and Dial. All day long, I would pick up the phone. I would call people. They'd never heard of me before. They'd never heard of the firm where I worked. And they might not even have heard of the job that I was recruiting them for. And I would call them up. And I would listen for these factors. And if I heard like two or three, I was like, all right, cool. I'm going to have another conversation. If I heard four or five, I was like, yeah, OK. If they're qualified, I can probably get them in front of my, can my client. And if I heard six or seven or eight, fish is in the boat. Don't need to worry about this search. Move on to the next one. And after the two or three or four month recruiting process was going on and on, my candidates would start to ghost me. Right? They would just disappear. And I couldn't figure out why until one day I realized I was calling them, asking them to turn their lives upside down, to move across the country, to take on a new opportunity, to move their family, to wreak havoc in their personal lives. And I was calling them with a checklist. And what they really wanted was meaning. And I learned that it wasn't about the value of the job. It was about the value of the job to you. So that's when I realized that there's this other thing called consonants. And consonants is made up of four things. So the first is calling. And calling is some idea of something that is bigger than you. It could be a business you want to build. It could be a project that you're running. It could be a product that you're developing. It could be a family you want to nurture. It could be a cause that you want to solve. But it's your calling. It is the gravitational force that gets you out of bed every day and brings you to work and has you excited to be here. And we get calling wrong because we confuse calling with purpose. So I was looking up, I was, I was, when I was writing this book, I decided I'd look up the word purpose. Because you know I didn't want to get called out by some troll on social media like, getting it wrong. And I looked it up in a dictionary, like an actual dictionary on my shelf, because I'm a millennial. Or cause, sorry, because I'm a Gen Xer, and that's what we do. <gasps> I wish I was a millennial. <laughs> and, by the way, for the millennials in the room, I actually 
talk really well about millennials, and I've gotten more social media uh, messages about the fact that I love millennials in this book than almost any other message, so shout out to millennials. Here's why we get calling wrong. We confuse it with purpose, and purpose is literally this. It is the reason for which something is done, period. End of sentence, end of paragraph, that's it. So if, the, if your purpose is to come in here and build the next coolest product for Google, awesome. If your purpose is that you want to work here because you're getting paid the kind of money that allows you to invest as a philanthropist in a cause that you care about, whether it's $5 or $5 million, that's awesome. If your purpose of being here right now is that you want to be financially free and be able to make decisions or you want to buy a Maserati and a beach house, cool. That's your purpose. By the way, if you want to buy the beach house, keep my number because I bring snacks and not teenage boys. I'm a good house guest. Your purpose is your purpose. There is no picture of Mother Teresa standing there going, oh, I don't know, I'm not sure if you're good enough, or St. Peter at the pearly gates with the abacus and the clipboard, and there's no picture of a friend going, mm, are you sure? Shouldn't she be doing a work job that you know matters more like mine? That doesn't exist. The only people who should get of vote are you and the people who you chose choose. And we have to stop giving votes to people in our lives who shouldn't even have voices. So that's the first. The second is connection. And connection answers that question of, what if you didn't show up to work tomorrow? What if you did call in sick? Would anybody notice? Would anybody care? Do you see a direct line from the work that you are doing today to the calling that you want to serve? When a gunman killed 20 children and six adults at Sandy Hook Elementary School, 67,000 teddy bears descended on the tiny town of Newtown, Connecticut. Now here's a pop quiz. Do you know how many people live in Newtown, Connecticut? 25,000. 67,000 teddy bears show up on this tiny town. That's enough to fill an entire gymnasium or an Olympic-sized swimming pool. And what happened to these teddy bears? Some of them got distributed to small children, right? These tiny rays of hope, these wonderful, beautiful examples of our humanity. But most of them ended up in incinerators and were destroyed. And I'm not saying there's anything wrong with sending teddy bears. It is a beautiful sign of who we are as a people. It comes from the most noble of places. And yet, the money that it would take to buy and ship and store and distribute and finally incinerate these teddy bears probably could have been used for something a little more impactful. So we get confused because we think action equals impact. And it doesn't necessarily. And how does this apply to your life? I would ask you to look at your to-do list. I would ask you to look at your calendar. I would ask you to look at this inbox that you hope to get to zero. And I would ask you to ask yourself the question of, what is all of this doing to help me reach that calling? The third is contribution. So if connection is all about the work, contribution is really about you. How does this brand, how does Google, how does this job that you're doing here allow you to have the kind of career you're looking for? to pay you in the lifestyle and flexibility that you want to have, to allow you to manifest your values on a daily basis? How does this job, this brand, this company, how does it contribute to the life that you want to build? And this is where I get to get, give an impassioned plea about my favorite word. And I love all of you men in this room, but I'm talking specifically to the women here. Ambition. Now, how many of you have heard ambition used as a dirty word? Oh, she's so ambitious, right? But they don't say that about men. I don't know why that is, and that breaks my heart. If we say it about women. So here is my question to the women in the room who are feeling uncomfortable about ambition. Would having more money, more time, more freedom, more flexibility, more power, more leverage allow you to show up better for the people that you love and the causes you hold dear and the company you want to build? Yeah, you're damn right it would. So I'm going to tell you right now, it's not your ambition. 
It's your responsibility. You've been released from the shackles of ambition. Lastly is control. Now, I am a control freak of the highest order, so much so that I like to sit on the aisle seat of every airplane, not because I think I'm gonna survive the fiery ball of hell when it goes down, but because I just like the illusion of control. I'd like to ride on that roller coaster of unknown length, not knowing if it's ever been inspected in the dark, however many times, without a seatbelt, said no one ever. And also, where is that kid's seatbelt? I have given this talk like 50 times, and every time I see it, I get twitchy. That makes me crazy. So control is your personal agency. How much control do you have in the work that you're doing so that you, can, so that you are able to influence how much connection your work has to your calling and how much it contributes to the life that you want to build? It simply allows you to know that you are in control of your own destiny. Each one of us is going to have a different rubric of consonants. When I was 20 years old and I was dropping out of law school to join that presidential campaign, I had all the calling in the world, but I was being paid in all the idealism I could eat. I had no control whatsoever. I, they didn't, I didn't know if I was going to be sent to Minneapolis or Little Rock, and I certainly had no connection because I was getting the coffee for the guy who got the coffee for the guy who got the coffee. I'm 48 years old right now, and I'm not going to get on an airplane unless I understand exactly why I'm going, what I'm doing, who I'm working for, and how that's going to impact my overall growth in my career. I have a much different rubric of consonants now. So my own definition has changed throughout my life. Yours will not be the same as the person next to you. And it will not be the same as it was five years ago, or 10 years ago, or 10 years from now, and that's OK. And so how do we figure out how we do that? We start to fail. We start to fail living up to everybody else's definition of who we are and what we are and what we can be and, God forbid, what we can't be. And we start figuring out who we want to be and leaning into that instead. So I mentioned earlier that I have these kids, and I spend a lot of time at parent-teacher conferences. And you can walk into parent-teacher conferences and, you know, I, those of you who are parents will, will who are parents will recognize this feeling of you go in and you have like your knees are like in your throat, right? And you're sitting there and the teacher's like, oh, yeah, you're Ben and Toby's mom. Okay. You got the little trickle sweat that goes down the back of your neck and you're like, oh God, my kids are never gonna leave my basement, right? It turns into this river, this you know, raging river. Or maybe you don't have kids and you yourself remember the day that your parents went to parent-teacher conferences and you're like, oh, they're gonna hear all the things I'm bad at. And so you, I had this choice one day. I remember thinking, my kids are failing left and right. They're not doing well. And then I realized, oh, they're supposed to be failing. They figured out algebra, it's time for geometry. They figured out geometry, it's time for trigonometry. You get trigonometry, hold the phone, calculus is in the house. Or at least I think so because I never got that far in math. But they're supposed to fail. In fact, that's what they do. They live on the bleeding edge of their incompetence because that's where they learn what the next thing is. They understand, unlike us as parents, as, as, as grown-ups, that failure is not finale. Now, I gave this talk in Austin, and this is the moment of the talk where I go, failure's not finale, it's fulcrum. And I looked over at stage left, and there was Commander Tim Copra of NASA. And Commander Tim Copra of NASA has gone on not one, not two, but three spacewalks. And I was like, failure's not finale, it's fulcrum. <sighs> Except for you, sir. <laughs> for you, it would most definitely be failure. <laughs> Don't fail. But for the rest of us, as long as there is breath breathing in your lungs, as long as you have blood rushing through your veins, failure is not finale. It's not the end. It's actually where you figure out what you're made of. And that means we have to start failing into living into everyone, expect, everyone else's expectations of what success should be. Because when we, make, when we do that, we make space for our own. 10 years ago, I ran the first mile of my life. So I was introduced to somebody who you know, is a relatively athletic person. And the funny thing about that story is that even now when I'm in the boat sitting in the Charles at 5 in the morning and the coach comes over and he's like, OK, athletes, here's what we're going to do next. I'm like, oh, he called me an athlete. <laughs> That's amazing. It is still super weird to me, but I ran my first mile of my life because 
I just woke up one day and I, I wasn't fat, I wasn't thin, I just like, things were, I had two kids, things were starting to hurt, right? I just, it wasn't great. And I walked into my kid's preschool and I saw the head of the school who looked amazing. And I was like, Ellen, you look really good. Like, you've lost a lot of weight. What's going on? Like, either you've been really sick or like, there's a new man in your life and you look way too good to have been really sick, so what's his name? And she's like, well, there is a new man in my life. His name is Mike, Coach Mike. And then Ellen proceeds to drag me to the darkest, dankest, dirtiest boys and girls club basement you will ever find. And we did all sorts of calisthenics and then we followed up by doing a mile run. You'd have to take, like, the coach gave us these, like, 37 teeny tiny little straws. And you had to hold them in your hand, and we would do lap after lap after lap, throwing these straws down. And I tried desperately to throw down two and three at a time, but he stood there counting all of them. It took me six weeks to actually be able to run an entire mile without leaning over and heaving and throwing up. I didn't think the floor of that Boys and Girls Club could be any more disgusting until I tried to run a mile, left some of myself on it. But since then, I found my inner athlete, and here's how I did it. I ran that mile. At the end of the mile, I was like, if I string three of these together, I could do a 5K. So I did. And I say do a 5K, not run a 5K, because there were literally guys with double joggers passing me on the uphills. But I did it, finished it. And at the end of that, I was like, ooh, if I could do two of these, do a 10K. At the end of that, I was like, huh, this is really interesting. I wonder if I could do a half marathon. And then, of course, we live in Boston. So I'm part with the training of the half marathon. And I was like, you know what would be really cool? April. So I come home and I tell my husband this plan. And he's like, you're crazy. That's stupid. My husband left a lot of his knees in cross country high school. So he was like, yeah, terrible idea. And I said, you know, I've been working with nonprofits for 20 years. If I can get a bib in the next five minutes, will you support me? No questions asked. And my husband is always one to doubt the ridiculous of my inane ideas. That yeah, sure, good luck. So I posted on Facebook today, you know, Com Ave next April, Hereford and Boylston. Within three minutes, I had 10 offers for bibs, and I've now done not one, not two, but three marathons. I'm a show off. But here's the lesson from that story. If I woke up one day and I said, you know, I've never done anything, I've never run before, I should go run a marathon, I never would have been successful. Right? We hear this idea, you can dream it, you can do it. And I think that's nonsense. I think if you can do it, you can start to dream it. Because when you're at the bottom of a mountain range and you look at the top, you go, boy, I'd like to go to the top of that mountain range. And then when you get there, what do you see? You see 10 other mountain ranges that are even taller. But if you had started your dreams from only what you could see in front of you, you wouldn't have gotten nearly as far. So if you put one foot in front of the other and you start doing, you can actually start dreaming even bigger. And that all starts by figuring out what success actually means to you, how much how much connection you want in the work that you're doing, how much contribution you want it to bring to your life, how much control you want to personally have, and then overall, what's the thing you actually want to do? What's the calling that you look for? And that means throwing out everybody else's definition of success and figuring out where yours lies. So with that, I'm going to stop for a minute. I want to take some questions. Could you help us make a distinction between following your passion and following your calling? Yeah, absolutely. So I think we should all work in our passion, right? I mean, finding something that you're passionate about is great. And your calling is absolutely that passion. My issue with following your passion is that it's this piece of advice that's sort of a standalone, that doesn't make any sense, that doesn't actually help you understand that your passion's going to be hard. Your passion's going to kick the crap out of you. It is going to knock you down, and you're going to have to get back up over and over and over again. And follow your passion just tells you that as long as you follow your passion, everything's going to be wonderful. So the minute things go wrong, you think, oh, this must not be my passion. Clearly, this isn't the right thing for me. And then we give up. 
And so my issue is not that we shouldn't work on our passion. We absolutely should. I want you to find that calling. It is the same thing. I just want you to know that rather than following your passion, you're going to have to invest in your passion. And that means doing things like coming to talks like this. It means reading books. It means watching TED Talks. It means having those uncomfortable com conversations with your boss about professional development, about putting yourself out there and being OK with the fact that sometimes you're not going to do as well as you hope. And that it is in that space when you're actually out there, nine toes over the edge, on the bleeding edge of your incompetence, that you actually learn. When I was running that first marathon, I got, it was 2012, and I don't know if anybody remembers the marathon of 2012, but it was 92 degrees. And at mile 16, I saw my husband who put bags of ice in my jog bra. And at mile 17, I ran to a friend who was like, that's a really great idea. And I was like, where did these come from? Right? I was so out of it because it was so hot. And when I got to mile 20, I realized that 20 miles is as far as you run in training. I'd never gone any further. And I still had 6.2 to go. And I remember thinking to myself, I wonder what happens now. <laughs> and there was a voice in my head that said, you're going to do this. Like, walk, crawl, cartwheel, get across the finish line. Somebody's going to put a medal around your neck and a heat sheet around you. Like, you're a superhero, and you're going to be a marathoner for the rest of your life. Ha, ah, amazing. Then there's another voice inside of my head. As my feet were like glue, they were like, they were like melting into the pavement, 92 degrees. Boink, boink, boink. Terrible. That said, what, are you crazy? You're going to die out here. This is the dumbest thing you've ever done. This isn't easy. This is hard. You should stop. And when we're told, just follow your passion, every time we hear the voice that says, this is hard, you should stop, we stop. So I want people to work in their passion, but I want them to invest in their passion rather than thinking, if, if I just follow my passion, it'll be perfect, because the minute it's not, clearly there's something wrong with me when, in fact, your passion deserves the falling down and the getting back up. OK, so I want to ask you, I was, I was introduced as a punch in the face wrapped in a warm hug. So I'm going to give you a little bit of both right now. I want you to think about those moments when you are at your very best, right? when you are in consonance, when the very best of what you do is being called upon to solve a problem you care about, and you are being rewarded for it in a way that is meaningful to you. And I want you to think about who you were in that moment. Were you loud? Were you quiet? Were you in public? Were you in private? Were you helping a loved one through a difficult situation? Were you working by yourself on the presentation? Were you closing the deal? Were you making it rain? Who were you in that moment? That's what Harvard Business Review calls your fundamental state of leadership. And I want you to find that state. I want you to write down those those feelings. I want you to write down those energies. I want you to write down the words that you were using. I want you to think about who you were in those moments. And I want you to stop leaning into everyone else's definition of success and lean into that person instead. Because if you continue to show up as that person, then that becomes muscle memory. And you can actually live in that state of consonance always. So I'm going to leave you with three questions. The first is, what would it feel like to have consonance in your work, where you didn't just have work-life balance, but work-life alignment? when you're investing in your passion, when the what you do matches who you are, what would it feel like to be limitless? Number two, what are the things that you need to change today? What are the conversations that you need to have with your superiors, with the people that you manage, so that the work that you're doing actually feels in flow with the things that you cared about? The reason that you were recruited to come here are also the reasons why you are retained to stay here. What do you need to do today, right now, to make those changes, to be truly limitless, to bring the very best of who you are to the work that you're doing here at Google? And then number three, what would be the cost if you don't? So thank you, and have a happy second day of school. <laughs>